Advocate Ike Kumalo. I didn't know you were so big. When you came in here, you tell nah, my nature is so bamba. Hey, welcome to the panel show. Uh, I'm excited to have you here. You you are deemed a highly controversial figure uh, in the public. Uh, you've been arrested. I hope we'll speak about that. But I I just like to welcome you, and I think just to kick it off, you know, when I used to hear you advocate I Kumalo, I thought your advocate was just a title like Doctor Kumalo, Doctor Dre. Are you a real advocate, and and what work do you do? Yeah, thanks. I'm excited to be with you. And uh, <clears throat> I was told many times, Guti, you know, uh, there's a guy, you know, who's got your ideas and he speaks like you, he does everything like you. And I was showing your videos a long time ago, but he left the, you couldn't mention how we were. So, <laughs> but yeah, normally I don't like I, titles like advocate doctors because I've realized that, uh, especially with Dark, mm. whenever a person says doctor, advocate, after that, <laughs> so they, they use these titles to to intimidate other people sure. and sometimes they use them wrongly because you'll find that it's a wedding and uncle is supposed to speak mm -hmm. as an uncle you know mm -hmm. China, but you will call advocates so and so will call doctor so you wonder what why can't they call an uncle why yes. can't one be an uncle but yes i do practice as an advocate uh, in the high courts but now i'm looking at tapping out because I want to move into more of the business space, have something that I can sell, you know, mm. because all of us must school, or most of us school in my family in where we used to sell things, you know. I was that kid who was selling everything, you know, door to door, still wood, I say perfume, <laughs> a eight day she in the stadiums. I remember I used to sell I'm a peanuts during the era which almost on and I want to you know African wanderers will come to Orlando Stadium I was that kid and only now that I realized that I need something that I can leave behind because you mm. cannot leave your degrees behind yeah and uh, you cannot have an honors then you say your daughter your child they must start from where you left mm. they still have to do their junior degree. 100 so that is the problem that i have so I, I want to leave something like you know you know indian families mm. you ask them adversity you go to why are you not preparing your cv he says no i'm going to work for my dad Boom. which education should do that you know if you should say you know what how do i expand the family business even now if i don't have a pizza because our pizza and i already started at home mm. things like that so i believe in that so maybe you know, thank you i came to your show too soon because uh, you know and like i normally say that you know at this stage i feel like i've underperformed i've disappointed mm. my parents you know and knowing where i come from you know you know your potential more cool mm. And uh, and you look, you know, you're looking back and say, have I achieved the things that I've set out to achieve? And I feel that, you know, uh, I haven't achieved much. I haven't lived, you know, the way I would want to. So I feel a bit, you know, disappointed, but there's still, you know, room, as they say, I, I think you've done so much and you've, you've actually become one of the important voices out there. And I know we called alternative voices, which were not funny enough. I, I think we echo the thoughts of many people, but people have, have become scared. Um, as an advocate, has your career been affected? Because you were arrested and you were accused of inciting the looting. Yeah, after my arrest, uh, I had jobs, you know, or briefs lined up, you know. You, become a, you became a celebrity advocate. Yeah. <laughs> In a, in, a, in, a, in a sense that, you know, in a negative way. Okay. Because remember, uh, as an advocate, you are briefed by your attorney clients. Mm. Most of my attorneys, or most of my clients, they are attorneys. <clears throat> and therefore, they wouldn't want to brief somebody who's accused of incitement and somebody who's going to court. Remember, uh, I would be in, in court, the very same court next week, which reminded my case, now I'm appearing representing somebody else. It's a, it's a bit strange. And now yeah. the attention goes, you know, away, you know, from the main case. And yeah. attorneys don't want that. And attorneys, uh, attorneys, I want to be in because attorneys are not straight people, most of them. You, you believe know. so? Look, this world doesn't operate as we were taught growing up. You know, mm. somewhere they make deals. 
you know, and then they cut corners here and there. So if they bring me on board, already my phone is tapped, my movements, you know, mm. are recorded. So they realize, hey, this guy is bring smoke. Mm. You know, they want to start investigating us too, maybe for tax or for deals that we cut. So mm. therefore, it cost me a lot because all those jobs, <coughs> they disappeared. And remember, uh, my expenses were very high uh, pre-COVID by 2019, 20. Mm. Uh, if I told you, my debit orders were around 90,000. Jeez! <laughs> <laughs> because because personally, not even the office, because I was paying for cars, three cars, and uh, I was paying insurance, life policies, I'm paying for a lot of things. And uh, yeah, and some... Who pay No, sometimes... You think that uh, things won't change because mm. if nobody has ever seen a lockdown, mm. uh, but you have to run, you know, because somewhere uh, you have to push. Sometimes you'll be in court, you are double briefed. You're not supposed to be double briefed. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes you'll be doing three meters in one day, mm. you know, because you're trying to keep up. You, you know yeah. that uh, I need about 100,000 plus. Just for my David orders. To live and, you know, pay everything. So after COVID, it was a bit tough. Mm. And also the jobs disappearing, you know, because I was arrested. It, it's a bit tough. You can think now the banks they are coming, you know, they mm. want their cars. They want you say, no, take this one. Hey, now they take the second car. Now they take and then you realize. Did that happen to you? Yeah, yeah. You had to give cars back? Yeah, you have to. But it feels good, you know, because nobody's running after me. You know, you know, sometimes when the calls come in and say, when are you mm. going to pay us? Because the banks, they want to know, when are you going to pay us? Mm. Give us time frames. And you say, so and so is still owing me. And I says, no, we hear you. You know, Ngapa is the house. You have to pay the house. Ngapa, you know, when you've got kids, all your kids, they're in private schools, <laughs> you know, because their mothers, they think that, yeah, you know, we must text him. And it's even worse when you've got kids with different mothers. Uh. Yeah, it becomes a scramble. <laughs> <laughs> how, because, how, how, how many mothers are we talking? I um, mean, I have... Let me confirm. Puma <laughs> 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 Let me confirm... Three mothers, but you know, four kids because the other kids, I'm still waiting for DNA. Aibu. Yeah, because you know. Yeah. Koni ngano ipiga yo? No, I don't. I love kids. I wouldn't. I, I wish I had more kids. When I see pregnant women, I wish they could be having my baby. Wow. You know, when I see pregnant women, I'm jealous. I love kids. Mm. You know, um, we've been taught to you know kids. You know, they're expensive and all that. Kids come in handy, especially if they're well taught. They're an mm. asset. You know, you can use them wisely. I've lived, you know, in Indians' uh, neighborhoods, and I've seen, you know, kids being used and utilized. They're all, you know, uh, building a family. They're all staying together, big house. Mm. They're all there, you know, contributing. So I, w I started late. I would love to have more kids because remember, I'm that generation, the first generation to use condoms. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. No, when Henry Taylor was still doing the advert, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, HIV. So now we were threatened, good to know, you must take care of yourself, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, I can imagine, see my clinic, you know, back in the days, but my 87, 88, so tell them my condom, but then I want one. The man's going to get a condom. my condom. Some, you know, Abu Mama, they would understand us, but sneak. So, and not to be so, so I use as it's a prevent, Abu. Otherwise, so, you would have had more kids. Yeah, Pelotina, we started a long time ago. Pelotina, huh? we were the family the house yes, you know? <laughs> so and ladies you know you'll be introduced to older ladies you know hmm. so i wish to be honest uh, i had more when i look at a person like jacob zuma i'm envious yeah yeah i'm, I'm really really envious like david masondo had i think 30 kids jeez nana coyote had i think 30 kids how much did i span yeah but yeah so the thing but if you can support them, yes, that is good. But 100%. if you cannot maintain them, you're just creating chaos. Why were you arrested? I was, and, and what happened to that case? I was accused of being an instigator. Good July, uh, 2021 riots. That case has mm. since been uh, thrown out of court because they were postponing and postponing. The state kept on postponing the matter. They wanted to investigate further. They wanted to investigate. Um, but so, why, why would they accuse you of instigating or inciting the the riots and the looting? I think because I'm I'm a thorn in these guys. I'm pissing them off, and uh, one of my content or one of the videos they said 
Uh, I made mention of Imaponya. Uh, I made mention of former malls because all our questions were going to why are they arresting people who've looted uh, be, uh, or taking the, the, what do you call it, the products that mm. they've looted? Because pick and pay in many companies, they came out clearly and said, we don't want those things back. But the, mm. the government was like, you know, going house to house. To, demanding, you know, products and saying, keep this leave. Even though the shop said, we don't want the, sh the yes, products Yes, I had back. a problem with that because, uh, and I felt with the government is the biggest looter. You know, no one is going after government. They've just looted 500 billion. Hmm. You know, Abu Cyril Ramaphosa, they've been looting from day one. Uh, all these politicians have been looting from day one. So why chase a, a David, you know? And with me, it was always that thing, you know, they had a grudge against me. Mm. And uh, I also questioned Abu you know, their involvement or lack, lack of involvement in uh, Phoenix. You know, people were killed, innocent people were killed. I and said, to this day, there's no accountability. Yeah, and I said, why not arresting the hooligans, you know, who've killed people? So mm. I guess, you know, they wanted a scapegoat. So I was one of those people who were mm. vocal and I was also vocal during COVID because I remember um, who's this, the Home Affairs Minister? Uh, Dr. Aaron? Yes. At some point, he said during COVID, people who are going to speak out against the pandemic, the lockdowns, are going to be arrested. Mm -hmm. So I was one person who was also vocal and saying, we don't have a pandemic here, we've got a flu. And I don't see the need to lock down the country, mm. you know, and I was surprised that doctors were quiet, engineers were quiet. Mm. Uh, I wrote letters to advocates to law society and said, let's challenge this in a class action. No one, you know, was interested. They say, I sit down and I knew how it was going to affect me as well mm. as it affected me that, you know, I didn't have an income, you know, during what, that. What, what makes you different? Why, why do you question things like that? Why do you question stuff that other people don't question? What makes you so different? Why can't you follow the the rules that have been set? I was always that questioning kid. And I, I think that maybe I was born in a wrong country. You know, because South Africa is a country where you are told to be humble. You are told mm -hmm. that you must disappear. I'm not like that. You know, it's something that is innate. Certain mm -hmm. things that you are born with it. Uh, I don't want to be like the other. I don't know. It happens naturally that, you mm. know, uh, you cannot avoid me. I I don't plan with today I want to stand out, you know, but I'm that person. I, I don't want to be bullied mm. uh, and I don't like to be a follower. Even as kids growing up, you know, there'll be that guy who's, you know, a leader in a group. Mm. I mean, you wouldn't lead me. Sometimes when I felt, with, you know, I want to go left. That's why I had lots of friends. Tomorrow, I'm going to Tomorrow, I'm going to Tomorrow, I'm going to It's like a lot of people, uh, you know, they were my friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't want to be put in a box. You cannot put me in a box. I suffocate when I'm in a box. So I realized that South Africans, they're comfortable in a box. They don't want to question. It's like, you know, let's go on as, you know, uh, business as usual. For mm -hmm. me, I don't think that that's the way, you know, it looks a bit abnormal to me. Mm. You know, there's a guy who once told me that he once saw Steve Beagle in Johannesburg walking, you know, uh, he said there was something different with Stephen Beagle. He said he walked as he was crossing the road. Mm. He walked as if he owned town. Mm. So I believe that most, especially black people, who should walk like that with pride. You know, like about Robert Sobugues of the day, about Oliver Tambos, they took care of themselves, even the way they dressed up, mm. you know. They were called metrosexual. So um, it's unfortunate that, you know, darkies today, they feel small. Americans don't feel small. Entrepreneurs, yes. winners don't feel small. And Nigerians you know, as well. Yeah, and Nigerians, they're good. You know, they say, you know, I'll make it, I'll, mm. I'll kill it. So you ask a black person with a PhD, a nuclear physician, uh, a physicist, can you do this? He say, I will try. Yes, uh, <laughs> you know, this world is very cold. You know, you've mm. got to claim your space. Yeah. Um, there was a question I wanted to ask. It's escaped me. You speak about inferiority, and I, I wanted to jump to this later, but I'll jump on it now. You speak out very much for men, and in particular, black men. Yes. And we've seen what's happened to the Kanye Wests, the Andrew Tates, the Jordan Petersons. Do you take from those people? And what are your views on where black men are, are losing it? When you say men, do you mean to the exclusion of women? 
I don't know if it's to the So when you say men biologically, as in men, as in <laughs> men, you know, <clears throat> look, I love black people, and yeah. I feel that uh, black people they've been given a raw deal in the last seven to eight hundred years. Mm. And uh, when you talk of black men, I also include women because <clears throat> I feel women are the most oppressed species on earth. Mm. That's why whatever that I have against black women, I will not air it in public. Okay. Because I feel that uh, black women have had a raw deal. I've got mm. my personal preferences. If you ask me what type of a woman that I love, I wouldn't want to say it publicly, mm. you know, because I feel that I must embrace all black women. Mm. You know, they've had a raw deal. But Abu uh, Andrew Tate, Nabo, Kevin Samuels, and all that. Mm. I don't know what motivates them. I don't know, you know, what inspires them. I agree with them here and there, not entirely mm. where I agree with them. Abu Kanye West, I believe that Kanye West is a genius. Mm. And uh, someone who was, you know, in debt, 80, 58 billion, uh, 58 million. Mm. And during COVID, he became a billionaire. That yeah. person certainly has to inspire me. You know, because most of us during COVID, we were crying and say, hey, lockdown. Kanye West just became a billionaire. Mm. And uh, I'm inspired by that, you know, and I, I look at him and I watch things that he do. And I don't think that he's crazy as most people think mm. he is. If he's crazy, then it's fine. Uh, most people are busy and genius. They're crazy. Michael yeah. Jackson was crazy. You know, Mahomet Ali is not a normal person. You know, you've got to be a bit abnormal for you to achieve certain things. You look at people like Abu Elon Musk, you'll find that somewhere uh, they don't have stable families you know, because, <laughs> you know, they are one, you know, tech minded. So yeah. as a genius, you got to be crazy somehow, you know. Yes. Where are black men losing it, in your opinion, in this country? If you're speaking seven, eight hundred years and we know that we're meant to be leading because if you look at other communities, whether it's Indian, Jewish, whatever, the men seem to be leading and the women follow. With black men, it seems like there's a disconnect between black men and black women. There's already fighting between there. But just for black men, where are they failing to be able to compete at the right level with other communities as well so that the black women can also thrive and win? I don't know exactly where to pin the problem, uh, but I think after apartheid, Look, I'll speak for myself, you know, mm. who was born, you know, back in the days in my 70s. We never thought that apartheid will end. Mm. I never thought that I would see a free Mandela. We always told that my parents were good. Mm. Mandela, you are a fellow child. So when the Berlin Wall fell, it caught us by surprise, all of us. Mm. You know, when 1994 comes elections, we're surprised. I think we're geared, because the generation here, it's really, it's supposed to be dominating now. Mm. You know, they're supposed to be setting the tone, the, the ones that grew up in the 80s and all that. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves that we are free. We don't know what to do. Mm. You know, we don't know what to do with, with freedom because we are so used to fighting apartheid. Remember, we are engineered to be opposing, crushing the system, but yeah. not to build. True. So, that actually is true. Yeah. So I think the problem lay there, you know, and then comes a lot of things that we are not, you know, prepared to deal with. Uh, I think men were not orientated, you know, 1994, between 1990 and 94, that they remember, guys, freedom is for everyone, you know, mm. be it women, be it, you know, a gender. So apartheid government, uh, especially the Africaners, they are mm. patriarchal, you know, they took care of men. Men must work, a woman must stay at home. Mm. So all of a sudden, we are all free. So men of my age, they didn't know what to do with it. Mm. All of a sudden, the women drive cars. Because if you remember, during Mbegi era, first term, we started to seeing women driving cars, women, you know, coming back from Beijing, 95, 50-50, mm. and all that. And, you know, all of a sudden, we didn't know what to do. But I still feel that uh, black men and women, they need to work together, like mm. other races. You don't hear white women calling their men trash. Mm. You know, we must work together because we are oppressed as a people. There shouldn't be a competition. You know, we are one family. As families, we can't compete. You know, we must complement one another. Enemies compete. Who's, who's meant to lead black men and get them to that mindset of leadership 
and coexistence and working with women? I think we should lead ourselves, you know, individual uh, spaces that we find ourselves. You know, we need to empower ourselves as individual because. But do you think do you think black people have that in them? We should, realistically speaking. We should, but unfortunately, we should. You know, unfortunately, black people, they've been engineered to believe in a messiah. If mm. you can check, you know, from biblical time, we believe that someone will come from somewhere and die for us and save us. I don't think that philosophy, it works, you know. Mm. Yes, leadership, you know, society, it, it's okay, you know, for someone to be there as a leader. If you look at Jewish communities, in spaces that they find themselves, they organize themselves, mm. you know, and if... They are selling meat and organize themselves. It's a dry clean. We need to do that, you know, and mm. lead ourselves and be responsible and promote these values that, you know, uh, as a grant in society. Unfortunately, now, yeah, the, the, the values, you know, we've adopted everything, you know, and including things that you don't understand. You know, we look at America, it's influencing us. Mm. And politically, you know, yeah, we're going nowhere. Do you not do you not see yourself as a leader for black people considering how much your videos trend and how many people seem to identify with your message which is deemed alternative and controversial um, does that not make you a leader i'm just a simple man man i'm just a man on the ground I mean, I, I, i'm one person that likes to be on the ground that's why mm. most people uh, even when we started about to do and all that, I said, no, guys, I want to be on the background because I mm. didn't like the idea of Ike, Ike everywhere. Mm. In most organizations that I've participated, even politically, I enjoy to be on the background, but I find myself sometimes you know, in the leadership by accident mm. because I believe in collective leadership. You know, uh, When we have a person, one person leading, Hey, that's when you know go about betrayal, you know, mm. and you feel disappointed because the leader has sold you out. But mm. I believe that everyone must lead themselves. And yeah, as a ground force, as a foot soldier, mm. uh, I'm good there. But but collective leadership is is the democracy we have now. And if you look at the nations that have been built into power, I I don't know if they employed collective leadership. And if we're trying to rebuild the black nation. And we speak about a black nation that is broken and has been broken for hundreds of years. Do you not think that maybe black people need a dictator, a face, maybe an Ike to show them the way? Unfortunately, I have to concede to that because every nation that, you know, uh, ever rose to superpower status, mm. we always have that dictator, be it a benevolent dictator. There's always that person who's leading, be it mm. Alexander, uh, the Greek is, you know, uh, he was there, you know, leading, you know, be it King Arthur. You need that in a society. Mm. Be it a Mandela, where he's taking us is another question. You need. Are you, that are you not society. putting your hand up to be that for the nation? Look, black people are very difficult to lead. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they are very complicated species because you can tell black people would listen, or maybe people in general mm. that. Listen, this is the path that you are taking. There's going to be some hardship. Whenever hardship now, you know, falls on you, they mm. turn against you. As they said with the children of Israel, mm. they remembered Egypt. So mm. black people are quick to do that. Uh, you look at people like Abu Kwame Nkuruma, people like Abu Petrus Lumumba. There should have been a succession. Mm. You know, Sankara should have been uh, succeeded quickly. Mm. People should have stood up and said, no. Uh, place compare you cannot kill Sankara and it's business as, as mm. usual. <clears throat> but black people did not do that. Stephen Bigot dies, Malcolm X dies, and Chrisani. Chrisani, and it becomes business as usual. And this world, we must um, admit that is governed, is ruled by mm. few elites from time immemorial, be it the feudal system, kings, there's always going to be people who are you know, controlling the means of production. And they've realized one thing, that an average man is a coward. An average mm. man is preoccupied with, you know, daily activities. An average man doesn't want to die for his conviction. An average man is concerned about things that don't change the economy, you know, or his life. An average man will tell you about the soccer matches. The last time they score, you know, he, They've got, you know, blow by blow, mm. even the 37 minutes, so and so scored, you know. But if you say, hey, there's an electricity problem, what are you saying? Everybody, you know, walks away. 
Mm. <clears throat> so black people are difficult to lead, you know, because they're quick to turn against you. But I wouldn't mind to be in that position, you know, but you must be prepared that you're going to suffer. You know, you're going to suffer and no one is going to rescue you. Check all the black leaders. Uh, they live in squalor, genuine black leaders. You go to the township, people like Abu, even Robert Sobiko himself, he was, you know, uh, committing, using a train to Vets University. And uh, I wonder how he lived when he resigned at Vets, you know, to form the PAC. Most of these genuine leaders, Abu Tietzi Machinin, he died in squalor, and everybody has forgotten about Tietzi Machinin. You look at Stephen Biko, it took Jewish interventions to come in and help him, Abu Helen Zile and all that. Where were black people? Because black people, they're supposed to protect their own and, you know, cover their own. Recently, Gaddafi was killed, you know, he was killed like a dog, you know. Business as usual again. Okay. Yeah, but Robert Mugabe, I don't like his Kotane tendencies because I believe that as a leader, you cannot uh, live in opulence when your people are suffering. Mm. Motibushi Bandes struggle with them. But he, he had a point. The African leaders were supposed to support him and say, the West is sanctioning you. We will not do that. We will, you know, trade with Zimbabwe. Mm. But they isolated him or they isolated Zimbabwe. So today, Zimbabwe will never recover. It will be like Haiti, no matter who leads Zimbabwe. Because one thing that I've learned about the West, they will punish you in perpetuity, like mm. they punish Haiti. It's a certain example. You know, once you can humiliate uh, the white class, you'll never recover. Um, was that not a clear indication to all of us that the African leaders, so-called African leaders, are actually not for the people here? And maybe that should have been the clear indication, because it was one of the questions I asked myself. If Robert Mugabe has been isolated or Zimbabwe has been isolated from the world, it's clear. You've got neighbors. Yes. They should say, look, we'll trade with you. It's fine. But the neighbors have been threatened as well. If you trade with this country, you will be punished as well. And if all of them are comfortable to watch an Ike Kumalo be arrested, be beaten, the kids that fees must fall, etc., does that not speak to the fact that maybe these leaders are not for you and they're for someone else? Yeah, they adopted the Springbok mentality, you know, when one lion catches one springbok it's mm. a chance for the others to run away <laughs> but they forgot that they're also coming for them even now they've been put you know uh, in a stage where they need to choose whether they are with putin or they are with ukraine so they have to choose mm. so if you think that they won't come for you they will come for you so they were supposed to drop this cowardice and support mugabe and say you know what we will never listen to the west there's so many of us you mm -hmm. know they cannot sanction the whole continent actually the whole world needs the africa but they don't see it that way because our leaders cannot think beyond the mercedes-benz mm -hmm. you know they think louis vuitton you know not knowing that majority of that material it's from here you know without us the world will not uh, move mm -hmm. so unfortunately you don't have you know uh, honorable people so that's where we find ourselves what has your work been with the Tutula? You spoke about it Tutula earlier, which when we set up Tutula. Look, it Tutula, when they started, uh, obviously they have a, an issue with the illegal uh, foreigners or immigrants. So me, I've been vocal since about 2008, even the first xenophobia attacks, uh, attacks 2008, I've been one person who's been vocal and say, you know, South Africans cannot be xenophobic. We've never been xenophobic. So they saw me as an inspiration. So, and hence with them, I occupied that role. I didn't want any leadership. You know, I enjoyed being in the background, mm. you know, as an inspiration. They saw me as an inspiration. So I was never in their executive. I didn't attend their meetings. But whenever mm. they had um, uh, gatherings, I made it a point whenever I'm available just to come show face and bubble but you know what I'm there. Sometimes, you know, they'll make me speak and say, man, I still call me just to inspire the people which sure. they mustn't uh, lose hope. They must fight for this country. Mm. Yeah, so it, it, it plays that role to say uh, South Africa, it cannot be a free for all. Mm. You know, it's for South Africans, same way as Zimbabwe is for Zimbabweans. We don't hate foreigners. Mm. We've never hated foreigners. Uh, South Africans, they welcome foreigners during apartheid when it was 
bad when they were liberated they came here besnabo banda you know mm. uh, many people from malawi they came here you know abanye sibabiza bosibale but after 94 that's where the problem started people started overwhelming us and coming with tendencies that we did not know you know there are certain <laughs> crimes that you know like about kidnapping right now this kidnapping for ransom you mm. know in the even in the townships you are not used to that you're not yeah. used to about nyamandao about you walking in the cbds a woman has been dragged into a building and raped i've known ama cases anjalo personally mm. where a woman was dragged in the cbds you know in a dark building and gang raped hmm. and for me yeah that doesn't go down well because uh i've got sisters i've got brothers and uh, crimes like that i grew up in a township during the the riots so we to hmm. we used to chase rapists we used to deal with them you know the harsh way so you, you don't think black south africans have the capacity to commit crimes like that Black South Africans. Like it's it sounds like you'd assume if you heard a story like that that it's not a Black South African. You go to CBD Johannesburg. Mm. Uh, black South Africans they no longer go to the cities. Even the accent, we know each other. Mm. You know, if in looks people would say I'm generalizing, it's fine. Mm. You know, statistics are generalizing, in, you know, by nature. You go in there, you hear the language, you know, even the victims, they will tell you that, you know, these guys, they speak Shona. Mm. South Africans are capable of crime like any other human beings, but there are certain crimes that have a nationality. Building hijacking, we don't know building hijacking before 1994. Mm. Uh, there are certain crimes that we didn't do, you know, uh, making bombs for cash in transit, we didn't do those crimes. You know, prostitution, when I see a child, you know, we still have those values. This is a 12-year-old. This is my child. Mm. I walk around, I see a 25-year-old. You know, some, you know, they are taken. Uh, the first thing that I say, I say, don't look at me, my baby. I want your mom. You're too young for me. Mm. You know, but other nationalities coming here, they don't feel that because this is not their country. When they see a 16-year-old, they see a young girl that they need to feed drugs and prostitute, and that cannot be nice. That cannot go well. And uh, even in our statistics, each time, you know, women prostitution, uh, girls have been abducted, you'll find that there's always Nigerian. There's always here and there, maybe Chinese involved. You know, even the MEC for police used to say that, you know, when a person has been cut, you know, the neck, you know that Zimbabweans are involved. Their Your crimes are so brutal. When a robbery happens in a particular manner, he knows that there are Zimbabweans. When there's fake products, he knows that there are Somalis and uh, Ethiopians. And we didn't know, you know, what you can make eggs, artificial eggs with rubber and stuff like that. You can make Coca-Cola can written packaged in Baghdad. We didn't know those things. Is, is this not all a form of xenophobia? It's not xenophobia. For me, xenophobia, it's when a person comes into your own country and starts to terrorize you. That is the highest form of xenophobia. Mm. And if xenophobia comes from that, you know, phobia, we don't fear foreigners. Mm. We went to school with them. We studied with them in varsity. I mean, I remember 1994, we played with Nigeria, the very same team that beat us, 92, mm. uh, 4 nil. <laughs> uh, we loved Okocha, we loved, yes. you know, uh, Sia Sia, we love all these guys that were playing, we love yes. Abu Rochamila, Abu Kameril. we admired them, we admired Nigerians because uh, in them we saw us, we saw mm. guys who are not afraid of white people, even when they play Sweden, they were imposing, you know, Nigerians, mm. they're imposing, we saw ourselves in them because we are not allowed to play internationally, sure. but little did we know that by welcoming them here in numbers, you know, they're going to start to terrorize us. They're going to start, you know, demanding things that they don't mm. demand in their own countries. They're going to have this entitlement culture of which I'm opposed to. Mm. And we need to know, you cannot just come, you know, in South Africa uh, to do hair. You know, come, you providing skills that, you know, we don't need. You know, you know, so, but people here, they just come in, you know, just to move around. And then at the end of the day, our hospitals cannot cope. Our schools, you know, you find that our kids cannot be admitted into these higher learning institutions because people, when they're here, they want houses. Mm. I mean, you look at all the CPTs from Deben and Cape Town, it should, those houses, they should be housing, 
young graduates, you know, young couples who just got married, who are finding themselves, they should be staying in those flats, but they're occupied by drug dealers, you know. And for me, I've seen people selling drugs in 92. I had friends who were selling drugs in my 80s. Uh, but it was a shame when you do that. You know that main drugs, you know, it was brought to near by soccer bosses and police. But it was not something that, you know, be everywhere, mm. you know. And drugs, you know, uh, they were sold. I don't know, man. Here and there, like in the higher pair of food. But sure. these guys, they come. At 50, I cannot be selling drugs. There are certain crimes that I cannot do. I'm too old to be chasing and, you know, grabbing cell phones. Mm. You know, there are certain things that I shouldn't do as an elderly person. But these guys who are here, they have no morals. What, what do you say to people that say that we're focusing on Africans? And you're very right in that we admire Nigerians, even to this day. When you look at even the musicians, or David or, or Burner Boy, those are all people we love. But what do you say to the people that are like, why do we keep focusing on Africans and certain poorer nation foreigners, Somalia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, but we almost never speak about these white foreigners that came back in the day, the British, uh, the Dutch, the French, that still to this day own a big chunk of our economy. Are those not the official original foreigners? that we're meant to be speaking about, that came to occupy, and they even set the borders to split us from our African brothers and sisters. I wouldn't agree with that because people focus on challenges that are in proximity with them. You know, mm. if I'm facing a, a challenge, which is somewhere in Lazi, I wouldn't go to Cape Town, solve a problem, I say Cape Town. Mm. I'll face exactly what is challenging me now, mm. of which uh, African foreigners they are, they'll be closer because they're closer to the, the masses of the yes, people. But it's also a, a misconception that says we are not focusing on white. Mm. When South Africans saying we want economic inclusion, we want economy, they're talking to white people. They're talking mm. to foreigners who came here in 1652. When we say uh, the banks are ill treating black people, we're talking to white foreigners, people who came in here. You know, uh, there's so many things that uh, we're demanding. When there were laws like BEE, when you say there is, you know, still discrimination, we're not talking to Nigerians. They don't have that kind of power. So we're focusing on all foreigners, but we, we cannot be focusing on white people. Then fellow Africans, they also come in, you know, and back tackling us while we are still focusing on the main economy, facing them, the real enemy. Mm -hmm. And this thing, Yoguti, we are all Africans, there were no borders. I don't take that because uh, there's never been a time when there were no borders. Borders, you know, are, you know, a development of, you know, mankind from day one. Mm. You know, Sikukuni knew where his kingdom started and where it ended. Yeah. We divided by language, by rivers, by lots of things. And if I come to your place, I must, you know, uh, adhere, you know, to the rules and regulation of that place. I cannot come here and, and say, no, Africa didn't have borders before the Berlin conference. Mm. But you go to their countries, they've got borders. Zimbabwe respect their borders. They yes. even tell you that Zimbabwe is not a province of South Africa. They do as they please. Yeah. But to say that we're focusing on blacks only, it is it is a lie because mm. we're still focusing on white. We want equality. We want economic inclusion. We're not asking that from Zimbabweans. Who do, you, who do you think has committed the most atrocities in South Africa between Europeans and other Africans? Look, I think that Europeans, because theirs is continuous, mm. they've committed, you know, atrocities. You know, Europeans, I don't think that they can live in harmony with uh, fellow mankind because wherever they went, be it Australia, America, they found black people, mm. they've terrorized them, they've raped them. But it doesn't mean that if the enemy and outsider is raping my sister, must also rape my sister, yes. which the African brothers are also doing, of which it is more painful when it's done by fellow Africans because they should know better, they should understand better. Mm. You know, with uh, Europeans, we, you know, we understand that's in their nature. They had to take, you know, when the European Renaissance started in the 1400s, they were needy. They didn't have the things that they needed. They needed raw materials. They needed food. You know, they needed everything. So that's why they were Voyager trips. They sponsored these trips to Australia, to mm. India. And they found our people. They find black people wherever they go and kill them. 
you know, because that's how, you know, a capitalism dictates, you know, uh, capitalism, it's a cruel system that uh, a man must be a slave to another man. So, mm. you know, Europeans, they executed that very well. What's the solution, in your opinion, for this country from a political and economic perspective? If we want to say we're not happy now, maybe we need to sort out the borders. Black people in the majority are poor. Maybe our politicians have been captured or they're not serving the people. What, what should we be doing? In King I need about King Azale country's name, but I still feel that we need to go back to the Genesis uh, 1994. I think we need a second round of Cordes mm. where we can tackle the economic Cordes, you know, because during 1994, the focus was on politics, mm. you know, and we neglected or we in a hurry to gain a political power. And when we got into political office, we realized that. We cannot move because we are trapped by these laws that you've signed bilateral, you know, multilateral agreements, international treaties. So we are ens enslaved by these treaties. Mm -hmm. But at some point, we need to go back and renegotiate. And also, in the very same African countries, we need them. Mm. You know, like Gaddafi was trying to rally all African car uh, countries so that we can have one currency, one bank, mm. uh, so that we can solve our issues. Uh, but that, I, that agenda has been parked, by the way. Yeah, because Since Gaddafi passed away, to what you were saying again, business as usual, as if that thing was never discussed. Yeah, because Africans, they plan for Louis Vuitton beyond five years. It's another one coming in and... Uh, they don't think beyond that. That's opposed to the Chinese. Today, mm. a Chinese president can die. The one who's going to come in, he thinks exactly the same. He's continuing the mandate. It's as if he's the same person. Same mm. with Israel. Same with England. You know, you rather tap out early and then they put somebody who's going to, you know, push the mandate to the British Empire. If mm. you're an American, whether you're a Republican or... Democrats. Democrats, there's one America when it comes to the outside world, we're dealing mm. with them. But with us, it's about me. What can I get for me and my family then relocate to Australia, which is which is sad. That idea has been packed. For me, I still feel that, you know, to solve the problems of this country, we need uh, that Cordesa and also need to have, I don't know, maybe courts or certain agreements mm. that will bind politicians. Politicians, it cannot be enough you bring a manifesto and say, I'm going to do one, two, three. Mm. And then you don't do that. We need to... And nothing happens. There's yeah, no you accountability. Need, you need to account. Like even today, if I can take this bottle and advertise on TV, in the media, and I say, this does one, two, three. If it does not do that, I'll be made to account. Mm. But the politicians, they escape freely. So we need that so that we have a plan that is, you know, a, a long-term plan and say, what do we do? Industrialize mm. if we industrialize. But also the masses must also expect that uh, if you change the status quo, some other people are going to suffer. Sometimes mm. you have to sacrifice a generation. Like, you know, in China, about 50 million people died. Mm. In in the Soviet Union, almost the same number of people died when they industrialized uh, Abu Lenin. So you cannot, you know, change a society without casualties. But unfortunately, nobody wants to die. Like Peter True. Toss said, we all want to go to heaven. So yeah. black people... Maybe it's because we suffered enough during slavery and apartheid, colonialism. We don't want to suffer again because mm. our memories are still fresh. But at some point, we need leaders that uh, are going to be so committed and of which they are so rare to find. But it's the society to blame because we allow these leaders, mm. you know, to, you know, to get their way. So we should not allow the leaders. As a leader, they must know that, you know, if I don't do one, two, three, I don't think that you can be a leader of Israel and betray the Israel uh, mm. people and its business as usual. That will never happen. Yeah. Well, you you speak about Codesa 2.0. Uh, back then, there were people, Nelson Mandela, I think Jacob Zuma was there for a while, Tabo Mbegi, uh, Ramaphosa. Who would you want to see at a Codesa 2.0? to discuss the future of this country, maybe the next hundred years, and why? I think we needed uh, as many people as possible because I don't think that this country belongs uh, only to political parties, but the question will be in what format do the masses, you know, 
uh, attend that uh, Cordesa. Mm. The shape as to how it will pan out, you know, in in reality, it's a picture that uh, I would not, you know, know exactly who attends that uh, uh, that that. That 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 Cordes. maybe in the now it will be all maybe political parties that have sure. a representation. Because you remember in Cordesa, the ANC had almost a veto right and national party. Mm. These other small parties they were there, you know, they were capital. More observers. Yeah. yeah, they were observers, mm. but uh, already when they negotiated. Uh, there were agreements. Pitora minutes was already signed between National Party and ANC. Mm. They went to Khoteskir. They had Khoteskir meetings. They signed agreements. Nobody knows. They never disclosed. This them. is not published, what you're talk, talking about now. Uh, the, 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 meet, the, the, the Khoteskir meeting. And the Pretoria. It's there. It's published. You, you People can, can go it. and search. Yes, you'll find it. Okay. They, they met, they, they, there's something called Pitora minutes. When National okay. Party met with the... Uh, uh, ANC. Actually, most of the some of the parties like PAC, they questioned that they wanted to know what's in the Pitora minutes. Mm. They were they met in Khoteskir. You know, everything was ironed out there, and they've been meeting outside the country. Remember the negotiation? It was not our project. It was a sponsored project by the Open MS and the Globalist mm. because it came as a result of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm. If you remember uh, when the Soviet, you know, collapsed. And we were forced to negotiate because the two forces, you know, were now making peace. Or there was just one force, the Americans, the Soviets, mm. gone. And they told us, you negotiate or else, you know. And then they came out and negotiated. They were given a template, mm. you know. And that's why when Mandela came out in jail, I remember that vividly. Mandela was talking nationalization. He was radical when he came mm. out of jail. He went to America. He was asked. He was still talking nationalization that you will nationalize mines, coal mines, but that scared white people. And that's why when he went to Genoa, that statement changed. About the Tombo when they are on record saying they changed the statement Sagamandela or the speech Sagamandela, and that's why the Sunlam came into being and say, you know what, these guys they want to take everything. Harry Oppenheimer said we cannot allow them to take everything. Let's give them a share in this economy so that they can defend it. They mm -hmm. coined the PEE. I mean, the first beneficiaries of PEE who were promoting it was the Khang Musenek, Ntato Mutlana, uh, Mohanyele. You know, a professor, his wife was sunk, he became a deputy secretary general of the ANC. Mm. And then they just pulled these guys about Tokyo, about Mutsipe, about Cyril. It's not because they are smart, you know. There's nothing, you know, uh, smarter Petrus Mutsipe can do that mm. you can't do. It's because they were sitting in position of power and they happened to be the right people you know, to be pulled, you know, uh, into these companies or plugged into these companies because they came with a political cloud. You know, mm -hmm. the white capitalists needed them so that whenever, when it comes to policy issues, they can always say, you know, go talk to your people. Like we've seen in Lawn Mill, mm -hmm. they say, go talk to your people. You know, so uh, we need to start our Cordesa that we can influence, not sponsored uh, in United Kingdom. Because I still remember very well, even in 1991, Margaret Thatcher issued a statement. He, she said, if the ANC think that they can come to the negotiations and take their mines and take their minerals, they are in for a surprise. She will send British soldiers to come mm -hmm. and guard. Uh, their minerals. That's when they started talking of the biggest army base in Botswana. They kept on saying, "Good, you know, America is gonna set up an army base, you know, in Botswana because ANC still had that communist leg. Mm. You know, they were still threatened. That's why people like Abu Krisani they had to go, you know, because they were seen as hawks. They were termed as hawks. They said ANC has got hawks and doves." You know, and other parties like Abu Black Consciousness, PAC, it was a short deal that they had to collapse, they had to die, you know, because they still wanted to talk self-determination. You can't have self-determination in this world, you know. The ANC will never serve the masses of South Africans because they made deals to serve foreign agendas. Must we, must we accept that currently? And not just them. Because this is not an anti-ANC thing, but maybe any potential black political party, if they don't play ball, they will suffer the same as, as Zimbabwe. You'll get the Margaret Thatchers of today making the same threats and big companies. It could have been Harry Oppenheimer and Anglo then, 
but it could be whatever company we have now. Is that always going to be the case? It's always going to be the case. If we haven't helped Haiti, we haven't helped Mugabe, uh, I mean, what hope? Because they're going to sanction us. And when they sanction us, everyone who's saying, uh, take the land, take the land, mm. cannot answer the question with uh, what happens when all these mas- multinationals sanction us? We use their currency. Mm. We use their system, you know, to transfer money. What happens? Because they're going to rally against us. Yes. You know, uh, is China going to come and save us? Is Russia going to come and save us? I don't think so. Because mm. even the Chinese and um, uh, Russians, they also deal with America. They're dependent on them somehow. So uh, what we see now is just tough for us. But uh, uh, basically, you know, they are buddy buddies, you know. So we shouldn't rely on them. We should rely on ourselves. And when you talk of ANC, without bashing the ANC, people need to understand why the ANC was formed. The ANC operates as a... A secret society is not for the masses. It's mm. for a few people, like how it was formed. Clergymen, educated people, academics, tribal chiefs, they formed that in reaction to 1910, mm. uh, Union of South Africa, when uh, the British Empire launched after the defeat of the Afrikaners. These are people who wanted to be included to the exclusion of others. Me mm. and you could not join if we are commoners. We had to have a representation or a representative representing us. That's why if you check the history of the ANC, they've been saying, please guys, allow us, you know, like you've allowed the African Airs. You've sent 5,000 men to help you in First World War, but mm. now you disregard us. So the change comes in the 40s when the ANC Youth League of the Robert Sobu were came in, you know, and saying, you know what, we had enough, you know, we want our land back, you know, and that was also hijacked by the Freedom Charter in the 50s, Mm. when we started saying the land belonged to all who live in it, which was reversing, you know, the the ANC Youth League of the 40s uh, Mm. program. So I'm not surprised during Cordesa when people were negotiating for themselves, Mm. you know, to get into position of power. And they made their monies, but the masses are, by the way, they use the masses to go and negotiate, you know, mm. to pl- get themselves plugged in into these companies. But at the end of the day, they forgot about that. Where is Tokyo? I heard that relocated somewhere uh, in New York. Mm. So you ask the first beneficiaries of PEE, what have they done? They still plugged into those companies to create you know, other beneficiaries to employ people. They've done very little. Mm. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that we find ourselves in that state. Yeah. Realistically speaking, when you think about it, do you think Africa will ever get to a level of superpower that China became, that a Soviet Union and Russia became, that an America became? And understand, the America is a second-hand country. It's not even a first-hand country because... It is a country of immigrants. At least maybe Europe, we can argue it's first-hand. China is first-hand. Yeah, America is literally a cosmopolitan immigrant state that has become powerful. Do you think Africa will ever get to that level? I believe it will, but it will take time, you know, maybe a thousand years. But it looks like black people are regressing on the continent. They're becoming weaker. They're becoming more social welfare recipients. And they, they're begging. We've... We've gone from complaining and saying we want land to becoming beggars of, I hope this company can hire me. I'd love to move overseas. There doesn't seem to be a sense of ever becoming powerful. And when a Gaddafi tried to spark the match, when people like Osankara were trying to do something, they were shut down. And again, business as usual. And it seems they've shut down the gates even more. I mean, you look at yourself and the work you've done. I don't think you've been radical, to be fully honest. I don't think you've put an army together and you were yes. bombing things and you were you were just saying your your opinions on social media. That yeah. is not even South African social media, and you were silenced, which now already scares yes. other like <clears throat> do you honestly believe that at some point Afri- Africa will emerge into a superpower and what do you think it will take? Yeah, you know, when you say that, I wish I had more power. Sometimes I wish I had power to bewitch people. You know, I would, <laughs> to be honest, if I had that power, sometimes I wake up. I don't have a constituency like some of the freedom fighters. You know, mm. I wish I had that, you know, 
uh, so that you know I put it into good use. Some people are saying, "Hey, you are too violent," and I say, "Let me not speak about that." Mm. But human behavior is something that you cannot uh, preempt because human beings will surprise you. Mm. You can see them regressing, and then one day they erupt. I mean, you check all the revolutions, even the Arab Spring. No one thought that the Arabs would rise, whether at the end of the day they were hijacked or their revolution was hijacked. But in all places where there was revolution, it mm. always comes as a surprise. No one thought that June 16 and Africans will lead, you know, a, a mass movement. People mm. were thinking that other big issues, like, you know, it will start in the farms, you know, start here. So human beings will surprise you, even, you know, in Tunisia, where it started. Mm. It just took one person, Jay, you know, who was upset and he put petrol on himself. And the next thing, you know, it sparked a, a, revol it sparked a, a revolution. So I believe that one day, it might not be now, mm. but at least uh, people now are talking about these things. In the past, they were not talking about that. They are regressing. They are aware when we regress. They are aware, which, you know what, uh, there is a problem here. But one day, it might take, you know, that one spark. Look at uh, what happened in 2021. People were not fighting for Jacob Zuma in uh, essence. People were hurtful that you've locked us down. Mm. You politicians, you are still uh, getting your benefits, you are earning your yes. salaries, but we were not earning and you are still stealing the COVID money on top of that. Yes. And then you are abusing us. And people just found, you know, that valve mm. and then they rose. So in a revolution, uh, you know, just a minor issue, you know, that does not make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. And people saying, you know what, we've been waiting for this moment and they just all come in. I believe that Africa one day will rise, but yeah, it might take a, a long uh, time because we've got opposition, mm. you know, but people do rise at the end. Maybe we'll be dead, you know, but we will rise. At some point, uh, we were superpowers. And to say that we are not organized, look at Europe. How long does, uh, how long did it take for Europe? Mm. You know, to be, you know, where it is now. I mean, barbarism. I mean, you're talking of a thousand years of barbarism. Mm. People not reading backwards. You know, if you go further than that, people living in caves, living with animals. That's why a dog is a man's best friend. It's more than that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't than, say that. It's, it's, no, I'm saying that, that they, there's a genesis for that. Jeez. And the black people, they had to save Europe twice. We civilized Europe twice. If You, you know, uh, Europe didn't know how to write. There were no houses. You know, you check here, you go to... These African countries, they already knew how to write. There was, Timbuktu. Yes, there was a doctor for everybody part. When there was no Europe to speak of, they mm. came in. But eventually, you know, they they adjusted and, and, and caught up, you know, and they took advantage of our generosity. If you look at the Dark Ages, they banned books, they banned mm. everything, you know, it took them years. It, act it actually did take Europeans exploring the world and traveling and, and copying and stealing ideas yes. for them to, to build the civilization they have today. Yes, Abu Greek or Greece, they mm -hmm. learned from us. It took them years, you know. That's why, you know, you could still trace barbarians. So for us, as long as there are those pockets of excellence, mm -hmm. you know, we need to encourage them. Obviously, uh, we will not rise all of us at the same time. No mm. nation that can rise all of us uh, at the same time. There'll be those pockets of excellence. They need to inspire uh, the others. So when we see something good, we need to support it. But unfortunately, we are very slow. Even now, as looking at the technology, mm. we react very slowly, you know, and I mean, electric cars are coming in. Yeah. And we are still producing a combustion engine. Mm. Uh, we're not even training people to say, you know what? What are we going to do with these cars that are already on the roads? How are we going to convert that? How are we going to convert that yeah, into electric? Because you need to convert That's a good that. Idea. Yes, you know, you can have money. You can make money if you can convert that technology. You know, a solar panel, when you're sleeping, you charge. Mm. I mean, there's so many things that we can do. Like, you know, I normally say that this economy should run. Mm. On a 24-hour basis, money must never sleep. I fully agree. Should have three shifts. You know, you can imagine if uh, we were like this, you know, at one in the morning. Mm. I mean, this water, somebody needs to bring this water, yeah. buy this water. Money is moving, you know. So unfortunately, Have, Having visited Asia, it's been one of the things that have disappointed me, that in Asia and certain streets in China, 
someone closes their business at seven in the evening. Yes. And then the next person comes and opens their business yes. at seven until the next morning when th- this person comes back. There's no, re- we've got service stations, garages. Yes. There's no reason why we can't operate 24 hours. And it's, it's taking Asians in this puzzle shop space to show us that you can operate from six in the yes. morning until 10 at night. And remember when you're sleeping, Asia is not sleeping. Other parts of America are not sleeping. So there are things that you can trade amongst us. We can communicate, do a lot of things. Mm. So unfortunately, we don't dream. So and it's killed. You know, it starts from childhood. That's why I I hate boxes. You know, when a kid is climbing on top of a table, but they think when I went up, instead of saying, you know what, what is it that this child is seeing? Because obviously when he's on top, his view is different from mm-hmm. those below. But then you know, I say, no, follow others, you know. Uh, don't do uh, what others are not doing. Follow the cue, you know. Uh, when I was growing, there was this friend I had, six. This guy, you know, when you stepping, I ask him, but when I every day, you know, I was What's no, I was So, People like that, entrepreneurs, they are not your normal people. Mm. So, but you know, we kill that. You know, when you see a penal, they say, this guy, why born on Ali Pride? Mm. You know, and who does he think he is? And then we all want you to fail, but not knowing that you can learn from you. And you must remember, entrepreneurs and leaders, people with vision, they don't enjoy the their success they their success it's finding new things yes you know they make a phone they leave it for the rest of the market to enjoy it and they, they want keep moving yeah i mean now elon musk is he wants something new mm. he enjoys that you know being in an office working alone that's his satisfaction mm. and tina we discourage that we kill it before it grows so we need to have leaders with vision unfortunately the people who are leading us they were in exile in backward countries mm. and they were in camps so i wish those guys uh, in government they were in exile maybe in scandinavia in sweden in, in innovative ways, countries so that they can bring what they've seen yeah but now they learn how to steal money <laughs> you know because in if you're in tanzania uganda you've seen idi amini you've seen you know how elections are stolen and you want to bring it here mm. so they brought their lowest standards, which is regrettable. But mm. uh, the new generation, you know, it's a different person. It's not all lost. Look at the guys who are growing up now. There's hope. I'm a piano. They're selling worldwide. Mm. You know, you're talking of, you know, labels, but to be trip, it, you know, they've got a global view of mm. which we didn't have a global view as. So when they've got a global view, they're thinking international, which is a good thing. Mm. You know, about Trevor no, about... DJ Clio, they are going overseas and, you know, making it happen. So I think there is hope. It's not all lost. Mm. You know, maybe uh, our generation need to die. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the younger guys. One of the things I, I love most about Nigerians, because I, I love Nigerians, um, obviously not the ones that commit crimes and hurt people and are destructive, is the fact that they're very big on exploration. I'm speaking yeah. about Europeans now and how their civiliz- civilization came from traveling the world. Nigerians, in my opinion, if, if Africa is going to rise, I have an opinion that it would probably be from Nigeria because those people, they are willing to go out into the world to learn. And to what you're saying, they go to a China, they go to an America, they go to a Europe, and they try and bring some of those ideas back here, which is what we need. Black South Africans don't travel as a, as a general. To us, traveling is an odd thing. If they hear you in America, you become a star. Hey, they say America. Whereas it should be a norm. The question should be, since you were in America, what did you learn? What did you bring back for us that we can use? How can you send more of us there? So I, I, I do implore more and more young people, we'll speak about black South Africans, but all South Africans, regardless of race, to travel as much as possible and travel not for holiday. These people yes. that keep going to Thailand, yeah. to the beaches, go to industrial areas in those places and go and learn and go meet entrepreneurs and come back with ideas like how do we convert uh, combustion engines into electric cars? That's, that's, a, that's an idea. We're not going to throw away these cars. We're going to take them and convert them. Go learn that technology and then come back and you could actually become a world leader in converting cars around the world because you found that in your travels. 
But credit uh, given to South Africans, maybe it's because their country it has been more stable as compared to other African countries. Therefore, there was no need for them to travel. True. Because if you check people who've done great, who've traveled like that, it's because they were suffering in their country. Right. Something propelled them to say, you know what, I have to move. And in that suffering, they discovered new things. Mm. You know, they moved and then they became greater, like Chinese. Chinese, mm. uh, when they were the Chinese themselves, you know, they were dying. So we were better than China in the 60s, 70s. Yeah. But it caused them to go to other countries. I remember Chinese citizens when they came here, even as late as 90s, they were selling watches, you know, selling, you know, small things that we as to helicopter do. Mm. So maybe South Africans in the future, you know, uh, they will feel discomfort and say, you know what, we need to go and explore somewhere or outside. But Nigerians, it's because, I mean, a population of plus 200 million people mm -hmm. in a small country. So it's a must for them to move. China, with billions of people, it's mm -hmm. a must for them to move. So hopefully not, uh, South Africans will learn what we, you know, what we can do learning from other countries in America, in mm -hmm. African countries, and come and implement it here. Yeah. My, my concern is that comfort you're speaking about, because Black South Africans are not well off if you compare us to the rest of the continent. Yeah. But we look like that. But now when you're feeding someone a, a, a grant, it's like putting a dummy in their mouth so that they become comfortable and they don't feel a need to explore. I wanted to say, I hate the fact that the, the looting and the riots in 2021 were attributed to Jacob Zuma, because the reality is that it should have been attributed to the leadership of the ANC at that time, because they're the ones that agreed with the World Health Organization to lock down the country. Yes. And people that don't earn grants, they know how to hustle. But to make a bit of money. You were taking that away from them, and that's yes. what led to the desperation. Were you not disappointed at what came after the looting and the riots? Because one of the things that hurt me was seeing, okay, so shopping centers in Makas have been burnt. There's no business happening here. Discomfort. This is now meant to be the opportune time for Black South Africans and Makasi to now build their own businesses. But instead, they were catching taxis to go to a town to go and buy. That should have been a prime opportunity to be like, now that there's a bit of discomfort and tragedy, this is the best time for you to actually build the Kaslako to be a Black-owned economy. One of the things that I said is that during COVID, it's time to procure things like gloves, you know, here at home. There is no need for us, you know, for Houting Department of Health to tell you that 80% of what they use comes from China mm. or outside. So it was a chance for us, you know, uh, to bypass all these bilateral agreements to say, guys, we have got a state of emergency. Yes, we so have no choice. We have no choice. You know, we have to... Um, bypass some of the agreements. If you've got agreements with pharmaceuticals, hold on, you know, let us uh, empower our own people. Even during the riots, uh, one of the things that uh, I said is that, you know what, uh, maybe it's high time that we question the ownership of these establishments. Yes, it's said that they have fallen, but maybe we need to replace them by our own. If it's Maponya Mall, if it's... Uh, you know, whatever mall, uh, mm -hmm. company, then let's bring in black uh, companies, sponsor them. But that did not happen. So that's the unfortunate uh, part of it. And we adopted everything mm -hmm. from this UN and, you know, World Health Organization with a clear agenda that we knew. But you also spoke about e e grants, of which it was also used, you know, to calm down people. But uh, one of your statement that you said uh, i know that you're big on grants that you know you hate grants you don't yes. like grants for me in an ideal world i would prefer people to work for themselves like without grants and all that but i'm not harsh on people who are receiving grants be it mm -hmm. 350 or child grants uh, maybe i think comparatively uh, I mirror it against these multinationals who are getting grants all the time. The politicians who are paying for nothing getting mm -hmm. grants because apartheid itself was a big grant. Uh, yes. they, they have got free labor or forced labor. Mm -hmm.
Uh, they cook their books, these companies, multinationals, they promise us jobs, they never deliver mm. on those, and then they get water uh, bills, you know, uh, cut and electricity bills, you know, they get just a free grace. Mm. Even Sir Ramaphosa before uh, Mangaum, when they brought in him, they brought him in to become a deputy president, his Sandunga mines were not paying for water. So most of these companies, they're getting grants, you know. Uh, Tabumbegi allowed in about 2001, uh, the biggest capital migration, they moved to London. That's a grant of some sort. For me, a grant, it comes in many forms. But people are harsher when the individuals, a mother of two, you know, is getting that, you know, a minimum. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm saying... You know, let's focus on grants here in entirety. Sure. You pay more electricity than uh, DPS, you know, Jeez. because uh, with them, they get discounts because they're mm. told that if you use so many units, you get this. And when you still pay, high because you don't get to use that amount of electricity for you to qualify for those discounts. So for me, I feel that people have been displaced, taken their land. You know, we've got so many people getting grants here. You've got tribal chiefs getting grants, you mm -hmm. know, politicians, ambassadors. I mean, you can check most embassies. You ask them, because as an embassy, what is it that you bring? Mm -hmm. If you're an embassy or you've got an embassy in in Japan, how do you measure its success? Does yes. it bring investment from Japan here to South Africa? No. So, yeah, but in an ideal world, I would wish that, you know. I'm glad you mentioned this because you're, you're highlighting exactly my issue with the, the grants that we have. Multinationals get grants, other big companies get grants, and we need to speak about them so that people understand what's happening. And if we're going to have a CODESA 2.0, we need to decide if we want to carry on operating like that. Yes. When they get those grants, they do them with the objective of going to make more money yeah. and be productive. When the South Africans who are receiving grants now, which is almost half of the population, receive grants, it's not to build. I'm not getting a 350 to go and buy seeds to plant. I'm not getting a child grant so that I can help my children. It's just to eat and shit and move on. But and so that I don't do anything. And I think for me, the reason I hate grants is not because people shouldn't be getting money to get by. It's because I hate what it does to the psychological state of the majority of the recipients. That's my issue. But I, well, with multinationals, unfortunately, they promise those jobs and stuff. They never deliver even mm. local uh, development. No one holds them account uh, accountable. But mm. when it comes to grant, remember as a government, how you think is different from a business uh, perspective because the longer the people live, that is profit. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. capitalism, it weighs the profit. Like Utabumbeg was running the country, minimum input, maximum output. As yeah. a government, you cannot see profit always in monetary terms. The longer the people live, uh, if you've got a, a, a lesser matter to child transmission because of ARVs, you know, and grants, you know, you've given ARVs, uh, that is success. Mm -hmm. If children are living longer, there's higher, uh, what do you call it? Is it natality? Mm. The mortality rate is less in, you know, children born in hospitals, they live longer. That is success. You know, it cannot always be measured by money. So for me, it is you know, success, you know, as a government, I want to see my people live happy, you know, happiness index also matters. Also the profit, because you also need money, you know, to push that. Mm. So I see that, you know, in a holistic view, you know, and say people must live happily, safely. And also you also need to buy them because if you don't do those things and they live in squalor, mm. it's not good for any society we're going to have. 60% uh, of the population not knowing what they're going to eat next. Mm. That's a revolution right there. So you've got to police that, but you've got to balance. You know, some other people might say, no, these people are useless, they're getting grants. But if you don't, look at the 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 implication. Like we've seen in uh, July riots. Mm. Imagine, you know, if people are starving for longer, what you could have, you'll have chaos. Don't we need the chaos? You spoke about lighting a match in the Arab Spring. The Isn't that what's needed? The chaos to what end? I'm to rebuild and get people to do for themselves. Because as long as you pacify them, they'll always remain children. 
Then if people are ready for that, but I doubt that the South African is ready for that case. People die in chaos. Yes, so, you, spoke, you also yes, spoke yes. about yes. Uh, for me, I might not. Damage. Yes, for me, I might not. It, it might not matter how we get there. But mm. if you are a ruling party or if you are a king of a nation, it will matter to you. Mm. You know. Uh, let me give an example. You see, when we are in court, I'm fighting. I want to win. You want to win. We are mm. opposition. But the judge is looking at the issues differently from both of us. Mm. He's looking at the holistic view, the society, interest of justice. When this one wins, okay, he's trying to balance all those narratives. That's why you'll take into account all that, the society. Okay, it's good for this one to win because this is fair thing to do, but we'll balance. Okay, when I punish this one, can I punish him, you know, heavier, then it'll be lenient. Mm. So as a government, you also look at that, you know, uh, when you take from John, you look and say, okay, I'm taking from John, you know, income tax, but uh, am I taking too much? Will I harm him? Okay, but I'm also giving this one. It's not a fair thing, but I'm trying to balance. So government thinks like that, mm. you know, to check. Like, you've got siblings. I can tell you, um, if your mother can give your mother 10,000 rent, your mother will not say, you know what, uh, Penuel is a hard worker. Uh, he's my favorite child. Uh, therefore, this money is only for his kids. My, your mother will look around even your useless sibling they will you will he has to survive you will give him something but bamba so ngakhuluma kumtshele panwen yabo bamnike imali and you support that <laughs> we live like that you know we live do, like that. do you support that <laughs> i support that to a degree like you know i'm saying I'm a, as a mother you look at all your kids including the one who's spoiled including the one who's a child bed mm. you love them all and when you've got resources you try to balance of course panel might get more favors because he's a breadwinner i bring let's say but this one he cannot be left to die Mm. Because we are prisoners of hope. We hope yes. that people one day they will change, they'll convert. Yes. There are many people who've got this 350 grant and say today, because of 350, I've managed to do one, two, three. There yeah. are people who started earning grants and they will tell you that, you know what, I used to earn child grant, I managed to go to colleges. I don't believe in throwing people out, no matter yeah. you know how long. I believe in giving people second uh, chances. So the mothers think like that. As a government, I would think like that. As a member of society, uh, there are so many people that I see in the streets. I talk to them. I don't condemn them, mm. you know, and say this person is useless. And more than once, I've been saved by these people that nobody talks to. Yes, I talk to homeless people. Like you know, I talk. You know, they will tell me, "Hot man, nunga yenga yee." Or going accident, the hot man go blind nunga yee. And some, I don't think that they even remember me. And they will meet me. And in the street, there's one guy I just bump into the other time. I tell hot man, so ham banga lebum. He play full lega like can. They will them shop. Can't you do you know me? But yeah, as nyawa as. Do you know me, come and bed? You know, I've met people like you know. Dirty, dirty in the street. As in Luland, somebody at our Ike. Because that's what I'm good at. You know, I talk to sweepers, I talk to especially the town foreign. So I don't believe in throwing people. Uh, you value away. human beings. Yeah, because people do change. Mm -hmm. You know, Malcolm X was not uh, the Malcolm X that we know. He was a hustler, he was a yes. pimp. So people, uh, as long as we persuade, you know, we can't kill them. We need to persuade them. So others will change. If we win one in 10, that's still a success. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't believe that people must die because they can't eat. You know, I'm taxed, you're taxed, you know, uh, sometimes you don't like how your money is used. But what we oppose is people looting, yeah. you know, especially politicians, because they don't need to. Just my last question in closing, as an advocate, meaning you are a representative of our legal system. Do you support the legal system that we have in this country, this Roman Dutch law? <laughs> do you think it serves Africans? Do you think it, it is best for Africans? And if not, would you suggest something else? Because we used to have laws, which I'd like to think started from the family to the community and up. Today, we've got laws that come from the top down. And it's not laws that Africans chose. It's laws that were imposed on us and they bind everything. We can speak pandemic, we can speak state of emergency, we can speak social welfare, we can speak politics, bilateral agreements, all of them boil down to the legal framework of this country, which is is underpinned by the constitution. Do you support our legal systems as a representative? 
And why? I do support our legal system. I'm not saying the legal system is perfect. All laws, they start from conduct, from me and you, and then it becomes a behavior. It's somebody writes about it at universities, then laws are amended. And unfortunately, with laws, laws are behind people. Technology is faster. Human behavior is faster. Laws all the time have to be amended to keep up with the human development. And now, if you remove Roman Dutch law, and then what? Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, something is not necessarily bad because it is Roman Dutch law. There's so many things that we use that are so American, so westernized, including the cars that we drive, the food that we eat. So if you're going to cast out things because they've got Dutch, you're going to have a problem. There are so many things that are good in the Roman Dutch law. Uh, some are bad. Like, for an example, in the same constitution, it has a clause that says equality, men and women are equal. And I doubt that all tribal uh, courts recognize that there's so many things that uh, are good in the very same Roman Dutch But do, do the normal courts recognize that? Because someone with money gets better legal representation. The person doesn't get uh, treated fairly because he has money. He's treated maybe um, in an advantageous way because... Uh, with money comes good legal representation. You know, uh, somebody who's paid higher, he'll investigate more, employ more people to look into his legal uh, case. Then when he goes to court, his presentations look better. If if I employed a senior advocate, obvious, a senior advocate, you would not pay less than 50000 Mm -hmm. uh, as individual, if it's companies, it can be more, depending on the nature of the case. A senior advocate can charge even 200,000, like the ETOL is one senior advocate that was back then charged 250,000 in less than two hours. And the senior mm -hmm. advocate comes with the junior advocate, it comes with an attorney, comes with a clerk, maybe you have a team of six people and you pay them. So obviously that person will have a better legal representation than is somebody that, is that with equality? the one Yeah. Is that equality in the eyes of the law? There's no equality when there's money. Uh, in terms of the law, the judge is sitting there. He, he listens to a better argument. This person, uh, like the, the please call me matter. Mm. Uh, when it started, a friend of mine was representing uh, Magate. He was the only one. Uh, he, he needed to bring in more people, but that is money. There was no money. But Vodacom had about six advocates, senior advocates and attorneys. This guy used to complain and says, you know what? Whenever I'm arguing, this guy's labor, patent, So whoever is presenting, they just give him notes. So when I while you are thinking, they confuse you. So because they had money, it took, you know, my God to get uh, unfortunately a team of white uh, uh, lawyers, they came in with muscle, they gave him money to represent him. And then that's when, you know, uh, they moved, you know. But the, the black guy did well because he was alone for a long time, you know, and uh, he, he did well. But so this is the legal system that you're defending and you're already saying with this bias when money comes in. If you don't have money, it's not But I mean, is that the legal system that you think we need, especially considering most Africans don't have money? It's unfortunate when you don't have money, but if I have money, it's your currency. You'll use it to your best advantage. For an example, uh, Oscar Pistorius, uh, you could afford, maybe we can have psychologists, you can have all the experts vis-a-vis -vis somebody who doesn't have money. You can have mm -hmm. gun experts, you can have somebody who deals with trauma to justify your case, and then it's up to the court to listen. They, we trust that the judges are going to look into the issues and say, okay, uh, how do I balance that? But unfortunately, uh, we have an adversarial system yeah, where the winner takes all uh, times. They look into an argument that makes sense. And then you you win based on the strength of your argument uh, because there was money. So if you don't have money... But, but how, how do you support this? Yeah. You su you're saying you support <laughs> this system and you're explaining all the reasons why it is biased and unfair. And if you look at our history, the people that came into this country made sure that they, they took all of the resources and this legal system we have is not ours. By ours, I mean Africans. And because they've made it a money system, they will always have better representation than the majority of the people. For me, I would say maybe we need to empower even the state, be it legal aid, to be at par. You know, if 
an opponent comes, maybe it's beat criminal case, whatever, if he has a certain expert, also have similar experts at a certain level, you know, or same level, but unfortunately the government is not willing to to put in the same amount of money. That's why even Jacob Zuma refused to be represented by legal aid. He had to go to Abu Dhabi and Abu Skakani. Hmm. And he owes them, the last time I checked, maybe somebody's donated money, he owes them millions, millions, you know. So unfortunately, it is like that, you know, if I'm arrested, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, to win. If I'm fighting a company, I'll do whatever that it, it, it takes to win. If I've got money, I'll use money, you know. If and if the opposition pays you more than you can make, you might consider losing the case. The opposition, if I mean what, if I'm an opponent. You're saying you'll, you'll want to win the case by all means, but by all means is a monetary thing, you've said. And I'm saying if the opposition says we'll pay you. I'm to saying lose the if case. I'm a party in a case, I'm mm -hmm. fighting so and so, uh, I, I will do whatever. If it, I need to get the best legal team, get money. Mm -hmm. uh, if I don't have money, I have to look, you know, be creative. What is it that I can use? Uh, but if my opponents say, let us settle, sometimes you look, you know, in some cases, they are not worth winning because you can win them only to find that uh, the victory is so small, but you spend more money in the process. Therefore, you have lost. But I'm saying that uh, other than, you know, going to tribal chiefs, uh, rather fix this uh, Roman Dutch law so that uh, where there are loopholes, we fix them. The constitution, I mean, the constitution, uh, it guarantees everyone that should be equal. Whether it's equal in, in reality, that's another mm. uh, case. But uh, I know in many tribal courts where women have no right, you know, mm. and that is wrong, you know, uh, the law guarantees that the children's rights comes first. That is a good thing. Mm. You know, if it guarantees that, you know, that people must have their sexual preference, the very same constitution is right. When the constitution says everyone is equal before the law, the judiciary, the executive, and the person in the street, that's a good thing on paper. Whether it happens in reality, we need to make sure that that happens in, in reality. The president and the men in the streets, they're all equal. And what I find, most people who say Roman Dutch law is wrong, they cannot pinpoint a section and, you know, it's, there are, uh, sections where they can pinpoint but there are very few. Like me, I know if like, for an example, when Jacob Zuma was complaining, uh, when you're saying the judge must recuse themselves. Unfortunately, in the recusal application, the judge become a player and a judge in his own matter. And the referee. Yeah, that is that. But that's Roman Dutch. We need to fix that and say, okay, if there's an application for recusal, let's bring a, a new, a, a, a new, a new judge to to arbitrate. So, but in the, in the absence of Roman Dutch law or law as it is, you have chaos. And if you check uh, to change the Roman Dutch law, the constitution also tries. Uh, to change certain things. That's why they say every law that is inconsistent with the constitution, uh, that law becomes a null and void. You know, it should be declared, you know, as, you know, mm. uh, not existing. So the constitution is there. And if you can check our constitution, it's written in a very simplistic language. Anyone can read the constitution. Unlike the laws in the past, before this competition, constitution, you, they were difficult to read because they were written in a legal jargon here, in, therefore, how. And, and some uh, Latin. Yeah, and uh, you wouldn't read, even the contract, you know, when you read contract at 15 pages, the 15, one section says as subsection 243 of page, then you must read it like this. Page. Mm. So now they try to simplify it and they recognize the the traditional authority, they recognize religion, it's a good thing, you know, uh, even though uh, the constitution somehow it's supreme, as they say that it's supreme. Mm. At the end of the day, it all, you know, ends with the constitution. If it's, you know, in violation, uh, whether it's your tribal laws, you know, if they are not inconsistent with the cons consistent with the constitution, then they don't exist. I mean, like Ugutwala, there are some people who still practice Ugutwala, which is, I believe that it's wrong. You know, the constitution, that's where Just it explain comes. quickly what Ugutwala is. Ugutwala, when young girls, Baringa Sotu Shubedish, when girls are abducted and mm. then taken by grown men, the next thing, uh, they are forced into marriages. That is wrong. Our constitution guarantees that. And says there are no. people that still practice that to this day. 
Yes. Most people who say Roman Dutch law, it's wrong. They want to go to tribal laws where they've got absolute authority. They're not saying it's wrong here and there. Let us fix it here and there. I mean, there's so many laws uh, that come from it. Even your Pi Act, though it's abused, you know, uh, that says you cannot evict people without giving them alternative. Some Somewhere it's abused. There's so many laws that are your health act. They come from Dutch law, from all this English law, you know, uh, Many of them, they meant, you know, to do good. That's why there's a process of amendment from time and again. You amend whatever that you disagree. When society grows and we say, you know, we no longer agree with this. Let us amend it. Like people now, they're calling for referendums, death sentence, of which I don't think that sentence will ever come back. Actually, it's impossible for that sentence to come back unless you have a revolution. Jesus. Advocate Ike, thank you so much for coming through today. I'm looking forward to engaging with you again. Bongami. I wanted to ask you if you think our legal system is just, but I'll park that question. And I wanted to ask you if our legal professionals, if you think they are good people in your personal opinion, but I'm going to park that question as well. Thank you for joining us. And I'm looking forward to engaging with you again soon. Thanks. Bongami.